I decided to run away with the circus. If I had the chance to go to space, that would be great. literally don't even have words to describe it. It's December 2019, and this is episode 43 of The Wow Signal. This is your host and producer, Paul Carr. Now, in this episode, we have a guest with such an unusual resume that I thought it'd be best to let him pretty much just tell you the whole story about his work, but I'll give you a very short summary. His name is Adam Dipert, and Adam is a circus performer, a dancer, and a nuclear physicist. And the reason we wanted him on the show was to talk about his work with human movement in zero gravity. He's done about 50 parabolas in a zero gravity aircraft. So I'm just going to let him tell his story. And Daniela DePaulis was the one who introduced him, and she joins me as co-host on the interview. And I'm with here with my co-host, Daniela DePaulis. Say hello, Daniela. Hi, Paul. Hi. And our special guest, Adam Dipert. Hello, Adam. Hello, Paul. Thank you for having me. Now, Adam, you have a very unusual resume uh, and that attracted Danielle's attention. That was her idea to have you on. Uh, Danielle, you want to tell us uh, what you what you saw about Adam that, that piqued your interest? Yes. Well, I met Adam uh, in person at the end of um, October. That was at the International Astronautical Congress. I had the honor, the pleasure to co, uh, well, uh, co-chair the art session of the International Astronautical Federation. And that's where we had Adam's work. He submitted it, an abstract that uh, we selected. And then um, the abstract was already very promising. And eventually, uh, I think Adam's uh, talk was one of the most engaging of uh, our session, which was, by the way, really interesting and rich. And I have a few other people in mind that uh, we might want to invite for the future. So, um, yes, what I really, uh, what I found very interesting about Adam's work is that uh, besides being a, a scientist, is a uh, he's a physicist, as I'm sure Adam will tell later about. Um, he's also a circus performer, and he knows, he understands, in my opinion, uh, a great deal about movement and dance, which uh, some people of, uh, of our channel might know. I am also a dancer. I used to be a dancer, a professional contemporary dancer. So this is a topic that is very close to my interest, and uh, of course, combined with space, it is uh, really uh, something I wanted to find out about uh, a little bit more. Adam, no, I don't know of anyone I've ever heard of before who's, who has been a physicist and a circus performer, period, not mentioned at the same time. Uh, how did you pull that off? Well, I, um, I work really hard a whole lot, and that's how I pulled it off. Uh, I am constantly engaged in my activities. Um, and in my life, I haven't been willing to separate uh, the various interests that I have. I think that uh, it's common for us to try to put things in all of their little categories. Um, but for me, they all kind of come together as a single package and are interlinked. And so the, the manner in which I found physics comes out of the manner in which I understood circuits. So um, when I was 19, I decided to run away uh, with the circus, not really running away when you're an adult already, but 
but I spent four years traveling and meeting every single performer that I possibly could meet and every single object manipulator around the United States that I could meet. And uh, when I was 23, my mom convinced me to get into college. I went into college and started taking math and physics classes. And when I got into multivariable calculus, I realized that the same things that we were talking about in class were exactly the things that I was thinking about with my body. And so I was already um, balancing sticks and rolling balls and uh, doing things like that all the time. And so when I saw the connection to the mathematics through my body, it all just kind of linked together and it all made sense in one coherent story. And so um, that was 2006 when that connection happened for me. And ever since then, it's just like very clear to me that circus and science are the same, same objective. I don't think I've ever heard me make that connection before. Now, uh, give us some more detail. Give, give something that you do in the circus that relates to your physics work or, or that you can, or at least your education. Yeah, so when I first started, uh, the first prop that really drew me in deeply, I, I describe it as like my sole prop. Like, you know, if, if I only had one <laughs> prop for the rest of eternity, this would be the one I'd have, uh, is the flower sticks. So this is a baton, and then usually you hold two hand sticks, and you balance the baton back and forth between the hand sticks. And uh, I can do one on each hand, so I can do two at the same time. And with this object, you really got to follow the center of mass of it, because that, as it's turning, the center of mass is the part that's like in the middle, turning the least. But then if you're pushing on it closer to the middle, then it turns more slowly. And if you're pushing on it further from the center, then it turns more quickly. So you have to be expecting how the angular momentum is going to change based on how you're touching it. And so I think this was like a really good prop for me to start out with that kind of takes a aspect of physics and spreads it out. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I also do, um, I, I'm a juggler, so I can stand on a ball while I'm juggling five balls. So I have a 30 inch sphere um, that I stand on. And with that one following my center of mass, like of my own body is a very important aspect of the activity. Um, I do partner stilting acrobatics so that I'm on stilts and my partner is on stilts at the same time. And uh, that also is very center of mass focused. You know, like when I'm standing on stilts, holding her leg, and she's got her back against my uh, thighs and her other leg is extended, it's, it's a balancing act. <laughs> <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> Literally. At least. Um, but while, that, yeah, while that's happening, um, I am visualizing the physics and I am tuning in to where our mutual center of mass is. And, um, and I think that having the opportunity to have a visual um, interpretation of what mathematics are really <laughs> gives, us, gives me an opportunity to experiment with it in my own life. And so, um, so yeah, those are some things. And then I also spin poi and um, do staff things and uh, juggle clubs and do rope dart. And yeah, uh, I, I, so I've been doing circus professionally for 17 years now. Wow. Um, and so you do a lot of things in that timeline, right? <laughs> yeah. This is the physics that we all experience. I can totally relate to these. Also in contact improvisation, we have these uh, balancing acts that uh, really uh, very continuous. They happen in a flow. And this is uh, earthly physics that I think intuitively we can all understand. But how about a physics that is outside of Earth? Or, you know, when I think about uh, physics outside uh, well, in, in the universe, in the cosmos, of course, um, I feel slightly um, puzzled on how can we apply that to movement, for example, or how would uh, those two uh, physics uh, inspire you as a performer? So I, as I, I've been six years now on my investigation of movement and weightlessness, and I have made a lot of observations about what it means to be a mover on earth. And I guess before 
I try to claim that these are my observations. I also have to say uh, Kitsu Dubois had a big influence uh, on me in this regard. And um, she is a French choreographer and dancer who's been studying zero gravity movement and perception since 1990 um, and is, is very informed about these things. And so I've had a chance to talk with her a number of times. So she's, her information has sunken into my mind and also I have my own observations. So I just have to say, I, th I think we're, I'm gonna reflect on some of that as well. Um, but when we're moving on earth, what we're doing is always having an opportunity to push or to pull on something in the environment. And even when you're in water, you're still pushing or pulling on the water. And that gives us a very particular type of perspective on what it means to be doing movement. In weightlessness, you could push or pull on things, but you have an opportunity to do movement that comes from inside, that is really just you moving. And it doesn't have to be about anything else. And it's really, as far as I can tell, the only place where humans can have that opportunity. Because when we're on a planet, we have to be touching a surface. We have to be in a liquid. We have, you know, it's like there is no, there are ways in which we can extract those moments of having self, uh, self-reflective movement, uh, movements which are generated solely from our own bodies, but, uh, but it's not most of the time. And I guess the re I know that as I'm saying this, it kind of, I, I imagine it sounds kind of abstract and like a high level interpretation of this thing. And, and that's, that's what I'm trying to give because um, that's really important. But if you could just break it down, um, there are things like when you move your arm around or when you move your leg around in weightlessness, the rest of your body is going to respond to that movement. And the rest of your body has to move counter to whatever direction your arms or your legs have moved because the total angular momentum in the system has to be maintained. And so, um, so this thing does happen on Earth. It's not like it's a separate phenomenon. It's just kind of hidden when we're on Earth. And, um, and so that's what I've really like been trying to investigate is just what are the possibilities of movement and weightlessness? I'm really excited when I find possibilities which are unique to weightlessness because those are things we hadn't thought about before because they haven't been useful to us. Like, why would anybody have ever spent time worrying about what it's like to move in weightlessness except for in the last 70 years? It hasn't been useful information, you know? It makes total sense. This is not a part of our default programming and how we operate our bodies. But how we operate our bodies develops the foundation of how we interact with the world in every single way. And so it's like really useful to figure out other ways to think about this stuff. And um, yeah, so that's uh, part of my answer to your response to your statement there. Uh, I just wish that people listening to the podcast could see Adam actually embodying what he's talking about by moving also in a way that somehow makes the explanation more physical. So Yeah, well, I, we have at least one video that I'll put in the show notes that people can watch. And uh, maybe, maybe that will help. I just watched it again just to get an idea of what he's talking about as he's talking about it. I When I was a in college, which is, by the way, way before you were, uh, we were watching videos of the Skylab astronauts doing zero-G movements in space. Now, these guys weren't, weren't talented performers. They were just astronauts. But I remember seeing them doing you know, things like holding their arms out to slow down their rotation rate and things like that. Uh, you know, I can't remember all the details, but uh, they had a big space to work in, in the Skylab. Um, were you, have you ever been, seen those and been inspired by them? Oh, totally. Yeah, I think the Skylab is the largest space that has been in space, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, watching those videos of them uh, doing the kind of uh, high dive type of maneuvers mm -hmm. um, 
I feel like it's Alan Bean who might be the guy doing the, the really crazy stuff, but I could be wrong. About I will that. look it but, up. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, they're, they're doing flips and, and uh, spinning around multiple axes at the same time. And what's, so the thing that's like just really been on my mind for the last maybe two months or something that I'm kind of digging into mathematically and figuring out what it means to me metaphorically is that when we are moving on the earth, we think about this relationship that there's like, you know, force equals mass times acceleration, right? That there's a relationship between the amount of force that you give and the amount of mass that there is. And that only when a force is applied, does something accelerate and move, right? And that its velocity changes. And in those Skylab videos, you'll see that without touching the wall, they change between having their arms extended to having their arms in tight and their angular velocity changes, even without having an external force. So the fundamental phenomenon that like, you can still have acceleration without pushing on something is different than our normal everyday experiences. And I think you really see that super clearly in the Skylab videos. So maybe, maybe, uh, I would suggest everybody try to hunt out those uh, yeah. you know, gymnastics and Skylab on YouTube or something. <laughs> and there's some video views I mentioned earlier of, uh, in, uh, I guess in the aircraft uh, that the, what's like, what do they call it? The vomit comet? Something like that. Is that, was that, <laughs> was that the aircraft? I, I think the, I think the official vomit comet was the old NASA plane. Oh, this uh, is the, uh, and, zero G ventures or whatever they call that. Um, yeah, zero gravity corporation. And uh, so they fly in the United States. Um, and it's a commercial flight, uh, that they do and they do research flights as well. And, uh, yeah, it's a Boeing 727 and I have been on it three times now. Oh. And so, uh, that's been the place where I've had an opportunity to experiment with movement ideas and weightlessness. Um, and my last flight was just about a month ago and ended up being a research flight, which was really great because we got 28 parabolas rather than 15. Um, and I was able to take uh, Tony Craig with me, who is a, one of the dancers that uh, I've been training this mm -hmm. year and for the last couple of years. And we, we just worked really hard this year. And so, um, so yeah, we had an opportunity to experiment with some movement techniques that um, I've been doing the math on or that we've been practicing. Uh, we practice in pools, in indoor skydiving um wind tunnels in aerial harnesses and dance studios, uh, float tanks, pretty much like every way that we can elicit some little phenomenon out of the environment that we're in and apply it in a realistic way to the experience in weightlessness. Like we're, I'm figuring out what all of those little elements are right now. Um, because if you train in the right direction, then you can like take something out and know that it's going to be applicable. But if you're just training and saying, Oh, you know, being in a pool is like being in weightlessness, but also you're still swimming, then that actually isn't as applicable. And so, um, so yeah, this year has really been invested in doing all the forms of training and figuring out how to apply those. And about a month ago, we got to put that to the test and I think it really came out very well. And I just got the video back this week and I have not edited anything out of it to share publicly yet, but those videos will be coming. And, um, and yeah, I, I, I think that we were able to access some unique movement paths. Um, and Tony is a dancer. Um, she's working on her MFA at Smith college right now. So, um, I had a pretty easy subject <laughs> as far as teaching somebody, uh, how to do this stuff. Do you think your work can be also used for training astronauts? Yeah, well, it's an interesting thing um, because it, uh, my particular angle on movement is to do things that are interesting, to do things that are challenging, and to have fun while I'm doing it, right? And I feel like that really facilitates a unique uh, relationship with movement. Um, and I've taught a lot of circus classes. And so the way in which I approach the actual training experience is 
I need to figure out what my relationship to the work is. And although I may have an idea, it's like, how does my body respond to that idea? Not just how do I stamp that idea onto my body, Mm -hmm. right? Which I think, right, that's like, as a dancer, you know this, that's one of the things that was why modern dance is so important is it's a rejection of ballet and the stamp of like, this is what you're supposed to be. This is the ballet movement. This is the ballet body pound. We just stamp that onto a person and now you like go out to go or go do that, right? And instead it was like one of the things that was being explored was, or it still is, is like, what is it to be me? And so I think that uh, if I had an opportunity to train some astronauts that I would probably teach them some very interesting things and that we would have fun doing it. And, um, and the truth is, I don't know everything about the astronaut training program, you know, uh, how they train for movement. Um, so I can't say whether, you know, I can't compare it, but I can just say, I think I would, I would have a good time. I think both of us would, ha- all of us would have a good time learning it. And there's a chance that the type of exploration that I've done in movement is probably uh, expansive and interesting. Well, you, you train in or, in water. They train in water as well. So, th- yeah, that's that's one commonality. I, I um, and probably the most difficult thing they have to do is when they're in when they're outside the space station and they're they're moving around, taking uh, you know doing repairs or whatever, and the and these mm-hmm. big bulky spacesuits. They, uh, it doesn't bear a whole lot of relationship to dance, at least not to my eye, but uh, it, it certainly has to deal with the physics of movement and zero, zero gravity. But uh, in general, I think uh, any discipline that teaches body awareness can help the astronauts to move more efficiently, more securely also within the uh, space station and outside. So it is more about body awareness. I think that uh, a lot of scientists, unfortunately, miss. Yeah, and And I thought also also in 1.6 G on the moon, where you're not in zero gravity, but you have very much reduced gravity. And we don't know what the spacesuits will look like yet. But um, that we know the Apollo astronauts at times really struggled to stay upright. And... uh, um, and it, it's actually very dangerous to fall on your back or uh, on the moon. It's hard to get up, though, so, uh, with those just the sheer bulk of the, of the suits. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's all kinds of potential application there. I think, you know. Um, yeah, and I, I think that the space suits outside the ISS, right, the EVA suits, extravehicular yeah. activity, um, they that's a really interesting scenario because that might be the most elaborate choreography that's been made in space so far, right? Mm -hmm. Because before every single spacewalk, they, you know, NASA even posts them. You can watch the, you know, animation of the astronauts going to walk down this side or, you know, uh, hand over hand down this particular uh, handhold along the International Space Station and they're going to like rotate around to the other side and then they're going to walk down this side and you know they like really show out every single step and that's exactly what choreography is is planning movement or planning a score for movement or planning a feeling for movement and then letting the people go through that experience and um, and so yeah I, I really look up to that and just think like wow you know they they're doing the work about what it means to be moving in space Uh, And they're clipped in, you know, um, but, and they used to have jet packs and, you know, there has been some times when they've had that chance to go jetting around out there. And that's a really cool uh, uh, idea. Um, But on the, on the moon, I think they did just recently release a video of something like what the new spacesuits are going to be. And they have a lot more articulation in the waist. Mm -hmm. Um, They they have much more mobility than the old ones had. And, um, and there's some really interesting stuff about movement on other planets that is much deeper than just like what is the spacesuit that you're in. Um, if you notice when you watch the videos of the Apollo astronauts, they kind of like bounce a little bit, right? They kind of mm-hmm. do this little thing. Um, and that bounce is not just, oh, it's easier to kind of hop or something like that. 
because you're in a bulky spacesuit or something. Um, the, the, the math that was used to figure out the relationship between dinosaur bones and how quickly they run, right? Because we had dinosaur bones and we had footprints and you, you know, do the math to figure out how quickly they're actually running. That same math can be used on a human. And the math is dependent upon the gravitational field that you're in. Mm -hmm. And for the human leg structure, in a reduced gravitational field like the moon, it requires less energy to jog than it does to walk. So their movement on the moon was much more efficient in much deeper ways than we think about when we're just watching them hop around on the moon, right? And they knew this <laughs> before they went up there, and that was the plan, was that they would be hopping because that is the more efficient way to be moving. And I think that is just a really wonderful thing to consider um, kind of how, how things actually work, how history interacts with the present and the future, right? Like you wouldn't think that uh, math from dinosaurs is the math that we need for the moon also, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's how it is. Wow. I, I had never thought about that. I just thought that it was because it was clumsy to be in a big spacesuit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that it is clumsy to be in a big space suit. <laughs> Is there is there a, a history of uh, this preparation that you maybe read or um, that also uh, other people? We how can we access some information about the training, for example, they had as astronauts before going to the moon? Uh, is there an, any paper or any reading we can do about what was planned in terms of how they should be moving, for example? Mm, yeah, so I um, I don't know about a good kind of pedestrian resource for that or, you know, like a, a recreational resource for that kind of stuff. Um, I have found a couple, not a lot, but a couple of um, scientific papers that were published by NASA um, in the 60s. Some of my favorites are between 1962 and 1965. Um, and so obviously that was way before the moon actually was happening, right? Because that wasn't until um, 69. But there is a, a number called the Froude number, F-R-O-U-D-E. And if you look that up on Wikipedia, it describes this uh, idea that I was just describing about how the gait of a, of a body relates to the gravitational field and how much energy they're using in movement. And so in that, um, site, there's a, a couple of links that are, are probably pretty nice for, um, for non-deeply scientific people because, yeah, definitely the resources I have looked at the most have been hard math that I don't think anybody was enjoying. I don't even know if the authors were enjoying it when they were writing <laughs> it, but, but it's a good resource for me at this moment. You know? uh, yeah, there's some of them because they didn't, you know, they didn't have like computers doing all of the work there then. So they had to do uh, estimates and approximations, and um, and yeah, it's pretty eye-opening to see uh, what has to be done, even with a space program, when it's like, well, we just don't have numerical analysis techniques that can just do a ton of work on a computer for us really quick. We actually have to have a very short equation that you could solve within you know, 10 hours or something like that, because some of the things computers do, humans, you know, we couldn't do it in our whole life, and it can do it in like an hour or something, so yeah. I'm excited about it, and, and, you know, we're at the cusp of this thing, it's really like, it's really happening right now, and um, and I'm, I'm just excited to be a part of it, and to be doing my little piece, which is what everybody does, nobody gets the space on their own, <laughs> Right. Uh, right. So, so uh, tell us about your future plans. So, before my first flight, I wrote a computer program to simulate the human body, um, mm -hmm. so that I could understand like the relevant parameters that there are. Like, if you move your arms and legs around, your center of mass moves around. So, if you extend your arms forward, then your center of mass moves forward. And why this is important is that 
you always spin around your center of mass. Or if you push off of something, it's your center of mass that moves at a constant rate. Right. And so, um, so we need to know where this point is because it changes. Um, and then also it calculates what axes you can spin around stably because you can't spin stably around all axes. If you think about how the North Star of the Earth changes every 25,000 years, right? Mm -hmm. Even though the Earth is pretty close to a sphere, its angular momentum is not actually aligned with its primary axis, and so it wobbles. And you do that as well in your own body. But if you thought about your body having that like change of North Pole, say through your spine or something, right? Like let's say your spine is going in a, in a cone type of shape and you're spinning the way the Earth spins, then you're always facing in a different direction. And so that's like a pretty complex, weird maneuver to think about being just in your body doing. So I've written some code to do this. And at the present moment, I'm developing a code that just uses uh, objects, uh, rigid bodies, in virtual reality so that I can manipulate those objects so that I can experiment with them and uh, figure out some interesting relationships between particular shapes of objects. Because um, fundamentally, I am an object manipulator. And I think where my body comes into all of this is that I'm, I'm going to be manipulating objects on parabolic flight sort of. But I, th I think the object manipulation is like one of the things that I can contribute a lot to. <laughs> And then that's kind of segueing into another um, program that will be more about the entire human body um, and being able to have a choreographic tool that facilitates creating uh, dances in weightlessness. And so that's, uh, yes, that's where my work is at right now. And I have a couple of um, talks lined up for next year. Um, and yeah, that's, 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 I would I, think I that, imagine I have something else to say, <laughs> but I can't think. Of I would it. think that Hollywood be, would be interested in that because then you know, motion capture and zero G is pretty much impossible, right? So they, 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 you could you could actually use your program to to uh, sort of simulate motion capture if, if they had a, like a, so a movie I, with astronauts, you know. Out. Yeah. So my my objective is a motion capture system that projects the body into weightlessness so that I can um, so that I can have a, a quicker access, even though it's not exactly the same. And there's a lot of caveats to what I'm saying. So don't, don't think that what I'm saying is actually quite <laughs> all the way there. But um, my observations are that Hollywood wishes to be as accurate as possible. And they don't always have the tools or the capacity to do that or the understanding, and um, that most zero-gravity scenes that have been in film in recent years could be improved a lot. And uh, I think there's a lot of you know, opportunity for developing more realistic things. I mean, basically what you have to think about is if we look at movies that were from even the 80s, right? Uh, the graphics and the physics can be pretty atrocious. You know, like we can be laughing out loud yeah. at how poorly they did something. And right now we're in this space, you know, explosion in the United States and there's all these space movies and there's all this, you know, all these rockets going off. It's like a really exciting moment. But the movies are not properly reflecting what's actually capable about going on in weightlessness. And in 10 years, we're going to be laughing at it. <laughs> You're going to be looking at their zero G scenes and saying, wow, they really got away with that. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> you know? So I hope that I have an opportunity to share this with more people and, you know, just give the work a place to exist because I think the, the study itself is interesting. And if it can um, provide a more realistic perspective to other people about how movement actually is, that would be, that's kind of half my objective, you know? <laughs> right. That's so do you, how do you bring your work uh, to the stage, Adam? Or, I mean, I'm, I'm talking mostly about the zero-G work. Uh, have you already uh, presented it as an actual 
live performance or is it mostly video or photos? Yeah, so right now um, for every flight we have videos and we have photos um, and I have not done an exhibit yet. I've done a couple of talks at uh, conferences. I think I've given like five conference talks internationally right now. And so that's pretty fun. Um, and, <laughs> and I am a patient worker um, and I would rather, I'm not a fake it till I make it person. I'm a be the thing that I wish to be and become that thing person. And so I wasn't, I wasn't willing to just say, I'm going into weightlessness and this is going to be art. What I'm willing to say is I'm going to weightlessness and I'm going to ask questions about my body and about movement and about feeling and about perception and about cognition because your perception does change or your cognition changes when your perception changes, mm -hmm. you know, like if you think about, um, you know, when your eye hurts or something like that, uh, then like your interpretation of the world changes. And that might be that you're frustrated. Um, but now consider when you lose all proprioceptive uh, capacity in your entire body, and now you have to figure out how to move through the environment. And that's what it's like in weightlessness. And you have to be thinking stuff while this is happening. So yeah, I have done almost 60 parabolas now, and I think I'm starting to get to the stage, to the point where I can say, I got my finger on it. I see where the challenges are. I see where the things that most people are expecting uh, are not quite accurate and how can we make small modifications to the schedule or to the um, plan so that we can make realistic plans and then execute them in weightlessness. And so, um, so yeah, that's really where it's at is I, I feel like I'm still becoming the person that I wish to become. And I think I'm way along the path. Um, I have had the chance to talk with uh, most of the people who are interested in this, as in like people who have been on parabolic flights and people who have been doing this, uh, especially Kitsu. And then there's another lady, Jean Morell. Jean is the artistic director of Nova Space right now. And she um, is Parisian and she, um, has gone, I think, two or three parabolic dance flights. Um, she has a cinematographer that she works with as well, Paul. And, um, and so I've had the chance to talk to them. And it really seems like this particular pathway where I'm using computer programming and I'm using physics and I'm using all of these training techniques in order to explore how the movement occurs is facilitating a unique perspective on this approach and facilitating an opportunity to be able to plan movements reliably. And that was something that I really saw on this last flight was I had a list of things I wanted us to do and we executed the things that were on the list. And that was pretty awesome. <laughs> you know, that was really cool to be like, I got a plan and we can do the plan. Wow. <laughs> you know? um, so, so yeah, I've been wondering if I was going to put together an actual exhibit um, because I have op manipulated objects uh, in weightlessness and it'd be fun to explain those things and to, um, you know, have them there for people to, to look at um, and, yeah, I feel like I'm just in the in the trenches right now, and uh, maybe I'm doing a poor job of making myself public by not doing those things, but I also have a lot of work to do, and I just have a lot of work to do, and I just need to do yeah. the work, and I, um, yeah. So, that's, that's self promotion is not your hardest. not your deal, then, is? <laughs> <laughs> no, I need to do that. It's, it's just everything's fine. <laughs> So nothing, nothing's driving me to do it. You know, I think if there was a disruption in my world, then I'd be like, okay, now I have, obviously I have to do that now. Um, but also other people, 
other people can promote you once they know your work and they appreciate it. That's all. another way of making self-promotion is letting people yeah. appreciate you to invite you and uh, make your name when, you know, there is an opportunity that fits your research. But when we were in Washington, D.C., Adam, we spoke about your work as a physicist, which is just as interesting as your work as a performer. And how do you fit these two works together? I, I understand what you said until now, but I understood that your work as a physicist is much more speculative, whereas your work as a dancer applies physics to movement. So um, am I correct or maybe I'm missing something? Yeah, I think, yeah, you're, you're right. And, um, you know, I haven't mentioned anything about my dance background, so maybe I should just say some things about this. Um, uh, I started uh, being fully dedicated to circus in 2002. Um, in 2005, I started at Ohio State to work on my bachelor's degree. And in 2006, I started taking dance classes at Ohio State. And Ohio State has a pretty solid, big dance department that's, that's thriving and healthy, and they have really nice um, studios and stuff. At that time, I also started working with Christina Isabel Dance Company in Columbus, Ohio. And they, um, well, Christina is, um, she helps the MFA students in the dance program at Ohio State to do their stuff. And then also she um, pretty much ran the entertainment and circus entertainment in central Ohio during the timeline that I was there. Um, then I continued with uh, modern and tap and some jazz uh, while I was at Ohio State and um, studied Alexander techniques through those programs as well and then uh, got into contact improvisation and for about the last six years contact improvisation has been my primary focus uh, in my dance life and so I have a, taught a lot of contact classes and attended workshops and have a thriving community now in Raleigh, North Carolina or the Triangle, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, and so you're asking how does the physics actually apply to that or how, how are they related and like okay so the other thing I need to answer is what is my research stuff so I study things about the nu nucleus of helium-3 atoms um, and so this is a study of the quantum spin state that's kind of like the thing that we're working to interact with the most and I do this uh, at cryogenic temperatures. So uh, 0.4 Kelvin is the target temperature. To give you a scale, uh, room temperature is about 300 Kelvin. Liquid nitrogen is 77 Kelvin, so that's super cold. Outer space is 2.7 Kelvin, and we go down to 0 0.4 Kelvin. So it's extremely cold. and um, and I do this experimentally, so we build apparatuses in order to um, to interact with the nuclei. And the basis that you have to develop in order to get through a PhD in physics includes all areas of study, right? So it's quantum mechanics, classical mechanics, electricity and magnetism, statistical mechanics, uh, Etc. Uh, general relativity, quantum field theory, stuff like that. And so, having the like range of mathematical tools facilitates a lot of different ways that you can look at the same set of mathematics. And so, you know, we might think about movement and from the standpoint of like, here's the center of mass of the object, and it's just going from one place to another place, right? And that's kind of like a kinematic idea. Or you can think about all of the little components inside of it as if they were like sub-components, you know, like your fo forearm and your upper arm and your torso. And now you have like this articulated form. And, um, and we would describe that as like uh, multi-body dynamics. And so that gets like a little bit deeper into how it actually is. And um, and so just on a like mechanical level, that's one of the things that the physics facilitates is the opportunity to actually do the math on like when I move my arm, how does that influence all the other parts of my body? Uh, but 
really this this week I had a, a totally opening experience. So I, I think I want to share that that moment um, with you because I've been doing this study of the body, and in that study, it has been about the center of mass and about what we call the moment of inertia, which is a um, a three by three matrix that describes the distribution of mass of your whole body. So it's about your entire body. It's like mass, but it's for rotating things. And there are ways that that rotating mass object interacts with the angular momentum that you have. <laughs> and I was in a lecture uh, with one of the professors that I work with, and we were talking about the quantum mechanical angular momentum and about this uh, spin, quantum spin of the helium-3 atom. And because of my last years of <coughs> trying to look at rotation through my body, I have developed some new understandings and uh, mathematical techniques for understanding how rotation happens. And they're not the ways that we learn about it in physics classes. Because there are a lot of ways to learn about it. And there are ways that are easier and ways that are quicker. And those are the ways that we are taught. But when I've taken all this time to study it in the way that was useful to me in this particular pathway, it developed an entirely new way of interpreting the mathematics. And I've been waiting for the moment when I saw my current study in rotation with the body come back around to my physics study. And this week was the moment when I was sitting in a lecture and saying, wow, I can ask questions that I was not capable of asking before. And it is only because of these last years of study. And those, those perspectives are not ones that we would find in the normal trajectory of uh, education right now. And so um, it's funny, as I'm giving you this answer, I'm finding myself saying, well, I'm remaining abstract and not giving you the hardcore <laughs> guts of what I'm talking about. But um, every time I start branching off into like what is the like real guts of what I'm talking about, I'm like, wow, that's not easily communicable because it's taken my entire life <laughs> to understand this topic. So yeah, I am. I guess I'm still searching for how it is that I'm going to like really communicate that whole idea. You know, how is it that I can bring you in all the way on the like? All I can tell you right now is there are different ways of looking at our, well, obviously there's different ways of looking at our bodies, but there's different ways of looking at the exact same set of mathematics. And we don't learn about all of them in school and not all of them are always useful, but I think some of them are gonna reveal themselves to be significantly more useful than we've given them credit for up until now. And uh, yeah, and so that's, that's one way to answer that question. Okay. Well, it looks like uh, we're not. It, it's all. It always takes a little while for somebody to figure out how to communicate physics <laughs> to the public, and it's not always the same person that comes up with the physics. So, um, it's uh, oh, we have to be patient. <laughs> Uh, I, I will be patient also, and I hope I will have something to report. <laughs> I just uh, want to express my thoughts uh, in general about conversing with Adam today, uh, that I get the feeling that the more I learned, the more I don't know, <laughs> which I guess it's a good feeling knowing not, of not knowing. <laughs> so uh, I find this research really fascinating because... Uh, I grasp some of it, but uh, it's more about um, making me realize how much there is out there, which is really, I mean, Adam is hinting at this incredibly interesting and interconnected 
things that I wish I could understand better in terms of also knowledge of physics and uh, so, but I, I can sense that it is extremely uh, broad, uh, extremely well researched and uh, I find it really uh, interesting because of that, because like a good film, a good poetry, it doesn't tell everything literally. You have to also use your intuition, your, you know, you, you have to be an active listener, an active uh, composer of, of, the, of the content. Well, Adam, thanks for joining us and enlightening us on your work. I, obviously, the public needs to know much more about it than they do at the moment, and uh, we're going to try to do our little part there. Yeah, keep, keep at it. It sounds like you're on the right path. Thank you. Yeah, and it's fun hearing that reflection or those reflections on it in the sense that, like, yeah, th this is new research, and we're just at the stage where it's like we don't, we literally don't even have words to describe it because in all of human history, there's never been a use <laughs> for us to have words to specifically describe unique experiences which occur only in weightlessness. And so, um, uh, and just to give you a kind of an example, when I did actually talk about this during this talk was we're constantly pushing on something on the earth, right? Right. And the, the capacity to move when you're not pushing on something, like we don't even have a way to describe that, but it is fundamentally different. And I think that as we develop that language, then we, uh, we will have a better idea about how to talk about it. So I'm, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to start sharing some of that research with you. Well, I know that was a lot of content. A lot of references were made. I have been taking notes, and as I find things that Adam refers to, I have been tweeting them. So if you go to at podcast. Wow, you'll see some of those things tweeted. The detailed links will be in the show notes, as always, at wowsignalpodcast.com. Again, this is episode 43, if you're looking for the particular episode. And once again, thank you, Adam, and thank you, Daniela DePaulis, for joining us. And now, on to the begging and nagging segment. As always, please... Leave us a review on your favorite aggregation service, whether it be Apple Podcasts or whatever. Please subscribe to the podcast. That way you'll never miss one. Your, your player will automatically load the new episodes when they become available within minutes of publication. And also, please let us hear from you. Let's, let us know what you think. You can contact us on any number of platforms and social media or you can just email wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com. Any more information you want to, how to find us is on wowsignalpodcast.com. With that said, I think I'll just thank the musicians. On this show, we've had music by DJ Spooky. And that's it. Just DJ Spooky this time. And I'm going to try to get some a wider variety of music on the show, but that's always a big effort to find the right music and then get permission. So it will take a while, but I will gradually expand the music that we have. Uh, but, and as, as you probably know, if you've been listening a long time, we've had permission to use DJ Spooky's music from both of his, his Creative Commons album of Water and Ice and also Songs of a Dead Dreamer, which I, I contacted his people and they, they agreed that I could use all but one song on the CD. And while I'm very grateful to DJ Spooky, a.k.a. Paul D. Miller, for providing this music for us to use on the podcast, I would like to branch out a bit and, and do some other things. We'll hear that before too many more episodes elapse. So again, go to wowsignalpodcast.com to find out more information, and we'll see you next time.
This has been the WOW Signal, a podcast produced by the Dream of the Open Channel. Please visit wowsignalpodcast.com for more information. All music presented on this podcast is either Creative Commons or is presented with the permission of the artist. The WOW Signal is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike License.